thank you everybody for coming to my session, uh, Distributed Agile uh, Project or Product Teams, uh, Dial 211. Um, again, thank you all for coming here. I'm really glad this is not an 8 a.m. Uh, conference start like a lot of conferences do, so I'm glad that they put this out a little bit. Um, all right, so who am I? My name is Joe Moore. I work for Pivotal. Surprise! Um, I work for Pivotal uh, in our uh, Pivotal Labs uh, services division, so we're agile software consulting um, and uh, work to develop products with our, our clients. I've uh, been doing it for a long time, uh, and in 2010, I had been, by that time I had been working for Pivotal for five years, and I, uh, due to life reasons, moved with my wife across the country and started working remotely for Pivotal. Uh, f and I did that for eight years, uh, 40 hours a week for eight years, remote pair programming for eight years full time. Uh, and so I really, uh, really felt the loss of a lot of the high fidelity, uh, co-located, uh, agile working that I was doing, um, agile teams that I was working with when I went remote, even though I was working with the same agile teams, really. Uh, but remotely, I, was, I was felt that I was losing some things, and I, and I also felt like we weren't being as efficient as we possibly could. So I really took it upon myself to... Uh, try to gather the best practices that I was observing other teams doing and this also the stuff that we were coming up with on our own teams and really sort of own um, for my own sanity uh, trying to make distributed uh, agile product and project teams as awesome as they possibly could be uh, so I'm definitely really interested in learning from you a lot of you probably work for distributed teams we'll get to the hand raising part of the session in a minute um, and uh, if there's, you know, a dream of mine would be for me to do this session and for y'all to look blankly at me at the end and say, oh yeah, of course, everybody does that. In fact, your stuff you're doing is old and crusty. You should be doing all this new awesome stuff instead. Uh, and uh, that would be a dream of mine. Um, so here's the stuff we're gonna talk about. Uh, like what does it mean to be remote? A lot of uh, guiding principles that I find help myself and the teams that I work with and our clients that, that we work with. Um, common distributed team uh, structures, because uh, there are a few, and I'm sure some of you work in various different kinds of distributed team structures. Uh, and then a whole bunch of pitfalls, pro tips, uh, tech suggestions and such. Uh, and uh, I have a feeling by that time we'll probably run out of time, but if we somehow have some extra time, we can go into some of these other bonus topics, like specifically about remote pair programming if you want. Um, if you are managers, we can talk about what it means to be a manager of folks who are on distributed teams uh, and things like that. Now that hand raising part of the session. Um, who, defining remote or distributed however you want, who is, works as part of a distributed team? Wow. You are in the right place, and I'm in the right place. Uh, wow, I'm going to call that 90% plus. Uh, that is great. Um, I don't know if any of these uh, organizations resonate with you, but just at my own company, these are some of the, the groups that, that, uh, that are distributed. Um, everything from our IT organization, our HR organization, our consulting teams. Uh, and, uh, and the reason at the end here, I said, and people who work from home, a lot of these folks work in the offices we, in New York and Paris and London and San Francisco, you name it. They work in those, org those offices, but they work as part of a distributed team distributed across the country. And yes, we do have folks who work from home as well. Um, I think that sometimes people think, well, I'm remote because I work from home. Well, you can be remote from your corporate headquarters as well. I know that there are a lot of people who work for my company who come to work, they commute, they walk in the office, and they put on a headset, and that's how they spend their days. Um, here um, are some guiding principles. Um, now you can shout out things if you would like. What are some of the things that make distributed teams successful in your experience? Slack. Slack, okay. Anything else? Communication in general. Communication in general, all right. Getting face-to-face -face occasionally. Face-to-face -face time, that's a great one. Anything else? Accountability. Accountability. That's a really good one. Anything else? Scheduled downtime. Scheduled downtime. Yeah, like we meet to play games. 
Oh, right, yeah, like having the manufacturing or reproducing that water cooler or, or break time. That's really great. All right. Unfortunately, most of you are wrong. It's all about technology. <laughs> um, it's microphones and Zoom and uh, Yeti mics and Google spreadsheets. Uh, that's all you need. Um, it's all just technology. And in fact, what it's really about is robots. Um, if I had a robot for every time somebody told me that I needed a robot, I would have a robot army that would take over the world. Um, but you know, jokes aside, uh, oh, hey, anybody, anybody at the, uh, the, the, the kickoff this morning? Um, but of course, it's not really about technology it's, or, or robots. Uh, it's about people. Uh, it's, so yes, in one of these pictures, there is a, uh, uh, some tall, balding Turkish man holding iPads with my face on it. But it's not about the little iPads. It's about them. It's about their faces. It's about the smiles on their, their, their faces. Uh, it's about the extra effort that they're putting forth to make their distributed team work well. Uh, it's people having a great time. It's being patient and having a good attitude. You know, surprise, surprise, almost everything is a people solution. And the technologies certainly enable those people who want to uh, help your distributed teams be successful. It enables them to be successful. But I'm sure most, many of us have, have worked at companies or worked with groups of people where they've got awesome tech, but it still falls apart because people don't have the right attitude about it. Uh, it's a lot about empathy. Um, it's a lot about, uh, so you brought up accountability a moment ago, and, and this kind of ties into that. It's the you know, understanding, hey, this might be hard as a distributed team. Um, I might not be able to see this person face to face all the time, but they're probably also working hard. Have you ever said, ah, God, what are those people doing in New York? Gosh, it seems like they're sitting on their hands all day. Well, I bet they're not. I bet they're working really, really, really hard. And if they were sitting next to you, you would say, like, what are those people doing? Oh, my God, look how hard those people are working. But you, when you don't see them, it's easy to, to create an us and them kind of, uh, of a scenario. And I, I know that that's super common in any group. Uh, but as a distributed team, it's super easy to have an out of sight, out of mind, or an out of sight, assume the worst attitude. Uh, here are some core values that I know uh, these are some of the core values that, that my company um, uh, tries to think about and tries to, to kind of live by. I feel like some of these apply a lot to this discussion. Things like uh, people over process. You know, you might say people over technology. It's not about Zoom and microphones. It's about, hey, we're all working together really closely on this. And we might have to work harder than we think we might have to, to, to foster that communication. And also to think, do things like foster collective ownership if you're a group if your company um, uh, believes in that. And, and things like eliminating risks and knowledge silos, uh, working closely as a distributed team to not fall into the trap of saying, well, you know, New York, they take care of that. Oh, guess what? We're in California. You know, it's 3 o'clock and they've all gone home. Well, I guess we'll just stop work today, too, because uh, we don't have that collective ownership. We've, we have not eliminated that risk. Um, and a lot of this stuff boils down to everybody on your team being able to contribute equally, uh, regardless of whether or not they are in two different offices or some people are working from home or you're you know, scattered all over the earth. And that is super hard. I and mean, that's hard in general. Having everybody on your team contribute uh, to the maximum potential and ideally having everybody contribute as equally, as equally as they possibly can is really hard in general. But as part of a distributed team, I believe it becomes even harder, um, which is why I thought I would uh, get kind of deep here if you'll entertain that for a moment. Oh, thanks. <laughs> even better. Um, if you are not super careful and very deliberate with your distributed teams, you will develop second-class citizens and first-class citizens of your distributed teams. Now, this is true for any team. I'm sure many of us have been on teams where there's the people who are like the deciders and the big contributors and the people who are, are maybe... Um, uh, suppressed a little bit by something in your organization or something in the team dynamics that haven't been successfully addressed. But I find that with distributed teams, 
that risk is higher and the uh, rate at which you get to that place is accelerated. Um, a lot of that out of mind, you know, out of sight, out of mind, um, out of sight, assume the worst kind of thing. Or, uh, hey, just, we're just not in the same room together, so there are the others. Um, uh, so what are some ways that you might be able to uh, listen and watch out for something like that? What are some things that might make you say, hmm, uh, this might be a risk on my team? And there's a million of these. Uh, I've got a little list here. And I want to be clear that I have said every one of these. I've been told every one of these. Probably more on both sides of that than a lot of people because I did live this every day in my life for, for eight years. So, uh, oh yeah, and unfortunately, a lot of you might be saying like, well, but I'm not trying to do this. And with so many things, it's less about your intentions and more about the actions. Now, the great thing about intentions is if it, it's not your intention to create these group dynamics that I'm gonna talk about, then if, uh, if your intentions are to avoid that, then you, you've identified the problem and you can take those uh, uh, intentions and turn them into action to address any of the issues that you might have identified. So have you said or been told, we'll use the whiteboard and everyone else can follow along as best you can? Um, uh, hey, how's your remote team doing? How's that remote guy doing? Oh, he's doing great. I, I haven't heard anything. I'm doing just fine. I've decided for him that he is doing fine. Right? Should we invite Dave? He's working from home today. Hmm, because when Dave's working from home, he's not a full team member. Huh, that's kind of weird. Um, how about some of the ones that I will say I fell into a trap as the often being the one remote person, the one remote guy attached to a team. Uh, hey, don't worry about me. Uh, I'm, doing, I'm doing great. And with secretly inside, I might be just raging with frustration, but no, I don't want to be a burden. I don't want to be a, a squeaky wheel. I don't want people to have to put forth extra effort because of me. Am I really that important? Do I want to impact the team that way? Um, forgetting to join the, uh, the, conference, the, the, the phone conference, uh, saying, really, I'm fine? Oh, this is, this is great. Um, or, uh, you know, talking to the phone for five minutes before realizing that everybody has hung up. I've done that, uh, and I've been the person who's hung up, so I've, I've been on both sides of both of those. Uh, so, and I'm sure all of us could come up with a million other little warning signs that maybe something about the dynamics of your distributed team specifically um, might not be as healthy, your team might not be as healthy as it possibly could be. Uh, here's a quick pro tip uh, to just sort of gut check some things and get a little, gather a little bit of evidence. If you do have a distributed team and maybe you have a group of people who tend to uh, maybe you're part of a group of people who tend to join uh, things, uh, meetings from a meeting room. Hey, why don't you take that from your desk the way a lot of your other team members might? That might be a good way to ch gut check when they say, yeah, it's working great. And it turns out when you do it from your desk, you can't hear a thing. Um, uh, taking your group uh, and splitting it across two conference rooms just to see how well does that collaboration work uh, when you have other distributed teams uh, or groups that you're working with. And have the remote people host if some of the, the stuff. So if you have uh, agile ceremonies, maybe you do retrospectives, maybe you do planning sprint or uh, iteration planning sessions and things like that. Maybe having your remote teams host those so you sort of turn the tables and build a little empathy both ways. And the real point is that we should all feel really terrible about ourselves. And we're all bad and this, we should avoid all of this and we're going to completely uh, flip the table on our whole org. But of course, that's not true. And is it bad? Well, classic, it depends. It's only bad, per se, if it doesn't align with your team's working agreement, the way your team has decided that they're going to collaborate. Maybe that person who's working from home is the CEO of your company, and they have to have the ma absolute maximum fidelity of interaction. So they have to have, everybody has to make that meeting super remote enabled. Maybe they're the chief architect of your, your company and they need that $10,000 uh, whiteboard thing so that they can constantly be diagramming out stuff. Maybe that person is the CEO of your company <laughs> and you ask them about this and they say, no, 
Don't waste money on all that stuff. Fact is, is I'm multitasking like crazy. You don't even really see it because I've got 27 things going on. That's an issue in and of itself. But that person may say, no, I, that's, we should, it's not worth, uh, you know, it is objectively not worth going through all this extra effort for the once every two weeks that I happen to be working from home or something like that. Let's, you know, I really will follow along as best I can when you point the laptop at the whiteboard uh, and do my best because that is a fair trade-off given the high fidelity experience that everybody in the room is having, right? So the point is to talk about it. So I took this, uh, this term from another, another group. Uh, we often will have, when the, team dynamic, when the team changes up, when we have new people added or people leaving the team, uh, forming a new team, uh, we'll have what we call a team norming session. And this is a great opportunity to have sort of like a neutral session where we say, hey, this is where we're going to talk about uh, the way our group works together, including the distributed aspects of it. So like, when do you start work in the morning? Um, who's got kids and they have to leave at three on Thursdays? Um, yeah, and also things like, well, how do we want to our distributed team to work together? You know, do we want to do the whiteboard at the, you know, the laptop at the whiteboard? Do we want to invest in some other technologies? Should we take a training session on you know, Miro or something like that? Uh, there's a bunch of formats. These are just various ones. You know, good patterns that we've experienced, wins, anti-patterns that we've seen fall apart on other, other teams. You know, uh, what to agree on now to do, what to think about for later, what to try. You know, what we're worried about. Um, and this doesn't have to just be distributed team stuff, but if you have these sessions, and I encourage you to do so, it's never too late, but definitely address the distributed uh, aspects of your teams uh, head on. And in that way, you, and, and to, to be clear, it's less about having this like artifact you can go and pull up and say, ha ha, see, look, on you know, cell E27, we said we're gonna do X, Y, Z. It's less about the artifact and more about the fact you're getting together to talk about these things, uh, especially uh, when it comes to your distributed team and giving the opportunity for those folks if you have the dynamic where maybe you have a central group and then some remotes that are kind of you know, work from home or something like that. Um, you know, giving them a forum to, to really say like, hey, here's what's working for us and here's what's not working for us. Some more. Um, some things I like to say about distributed teams uh, that I encourage you to like think about these two um, and see if they resonate with you or not. And if they don't, you might wonder, hmm, well, maybe there's something we need to, to address here. Uh, being present has nothing to do with your location. I'm sure many of us have been on a call where the people in the conference room are completely checked out and all the interesting conversation is happening amongst the people who might be distributed. So it doesn't necessarily mean matter where you're at. Uh, observation is not participation. Just because you can see kind of a blurryish something or other on a whiteboard does not mean you are fully engaged. Um, I had once had somebody uh, uh, who was in charge of some, this is not somebody who worked for my company, but they were in charge of building out a space, a collaborative space. And uh, somebody had a, wipe, uh, a laptop pointed at that person when they were talking about it. And I had asked a ch question in the chat about, you know, was the space going to be uh, enabled for distributed folks to like have a super high fidelity and awesome participatory experience. And that person looked at the laptop and said, oh, it looks like you're, got, you're doing fine. And then moved on to the next question. I was screaming at the laptop, like, hey, can you hear me? I want to have a, a follow-up. Eh, no. So that person was deciding for me that my experience was great for him. Um, and, uh, you know, that person had the best intentions. You know, he was like, wow, look, this is great. We have this, like, camera set up. But there was no double checking. There was no, you know, going back to something like this and saying, like, hey, let's actually figure out, does this work or not? Um, CNBC hear and be heard. Uh, you know, this, all of the stuff I'm talking about is totally a two-way street. It's, to it's not my intention at all to make it sound like, well, I was the remote person and then I had this bad experience or something like that. You know, me taking myself out of the equation, me turning off my video is me taking myself out of the equation, right? Um, me uh, n uh, being totally checked out because it's easy to turn that video off and surf the web and do whatever when no you don't have that accountability in that meeting or uh, in that pair programming session or something like that. Uh, this is totally a two-way street. You have to have the engagement 
going both ways because it's worth it. Um, all of you work as part of distributed teams. Um, what if all of you had to move or all the people that you work with had to move to one location? Would that even be possible? You know, how many people would leave the awesome people that you work with? How many of them would leave your organization for somewhere else? You know, talent is all over the place. And luckily, we're at a place where the technology has caught up to make a lot of even the super high fidelity, um, high bandwidth uh, uh, interactions that a lot of us rely on, things like remote pair programming that is pretty out there. Um, it, you know, the technology is at a point where we can support that pretty seamlessly. Uh, so it's totally worth it uh, to, to find those awesome people no matter where they're at. So that was a lot. I'm curious, before we go on to the next section, to hear some of your reactions and to hear any sort of uh, comments, stories, uh, tips you might have about uh, or uh, you know, anything kind of related to the, the identifying the dynamic where your distributed team is not working as well as it could and how you might have resolved that. Does anybody want to contribute anything? Please. Um, I have a sure. Are, are you constrained by, do you, one, do you believe in introverted, extroverted personalities when it comes to working with people and are you limited to work? And if so, are you limited to working with extroverted people who are going to speak up? And right. Yeah, the, the question was about uh, introverted versus uh, uh, introverted and extroverted and, and the uh, personalities and the sort of entire spectrum between the two extremes of those. Um, I think that comes into play no matter what. Um, and, you know, there's, I think we've probably all been in situations where we have people on our team where it doesn't matter if you're, what situation you're in, if you're in a meeting room, if you're, you know, in your team space or whatever, and there's some people who dominate the conversations and some people who uh, seem like you've worked with them, with them for a month and if they've hardly said a word. Um, that's, and I acknowledge that's one aspect maybe of an introverted and extroverted um, uh, personalities and there's a lot of other aspects as well. Um, so I think that uh, going back to like the team norming stuff, um, one of the things that I did show on there is we do a workshop uh, at Pivotal where we have, we, we ask people to identify where they are on several different kinds of spectrums including um, introverted, extroverted. Um, another one is how you prefer your communication style. Like, do you like direct communication? Do you like indirect communication? And put yourself on the sliders there. Um, and you can do that anonymously in this thing I'm talking about. Uh, but often people will volunteer. They're like, well, I'm, you know, I'm the one who's put my little mark on the scale way at the extreme of extroverted because of such and such. And somebody else, um, you know, the fact that they might have put their mark far on the introverted uh, part of the scale is an invitation for them to talk more about that. So I think that's a good, you know, certainly distributed teams have, it's easy for perhaps people who want to check out to sort of check out or remain a bit more anonymous um, when you're distributed and you can turn your video or off or whatever. But uh, again, talking about it is the important part. Yes? Um, what experiences have you had with having um, either someone with a Externally to the team facilitating, mm. or internally wearing that hat just for a meeting or a ceremony. Right. Or something. Yeah. Yeah. Bringing in an external facilitator for something like you know these kind of sessions uh, can be can be amazing. Um, one, some folks are just really good at facilitating. They might do it a lot, and they can bring things out of the group that might not otherwise get pulled out. Uh, and two, it 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 allow it it avoids a situation where uh, somebody inside the team might say, how's our distributed team working? Working great, moving on, you know, and then they just sort of dominate it. So I think it's a great idea. Cool. Yes? Any advice on dealing with teams across different time zones? Ooh, time zones. That's a big one. I'm going to come to that later. Spoiler alert. Uh, it's the one thing that technology cannot solve. Technologies can solve basically everything else. Money can solve that problem. And I've heard people say, like, no, not really. It's like, quadruple your salary if you shift your hours by six hours. And everyone's, and then it's like, well, well meh. <laughs> All right. So everybody, you know, the, but the, 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 the short of it is, 
it's, it's important, I'll talk about it here in a second, but it, it's, it's, it's important to identify how much collaboration you have to have between those time zones, and is there a way of dividing up the, I'll just call it like the domain that you work in, into independent enough things that you can have, yes, a lot of touch points, but to, to reduce the um, number of, uh, uh, the amount of coupling or the amount of sort of dependencies between those teams. It's probably stuff you already know about, but it's, it's super hard. Um, OK, I'll take one more before moving on. You. As weird as it may sound, but my fear was this, that distributing a team even further helped. Like the original setup was that we had the office team in a conference room, and, and people connected remotely by Zoom. Um, and those people connected remotely, they were kind of cut off. Um, and so what we did was to not gather all the people in the conference room, but everybody would connect remotely. By right. Zoom. Right, right. Have, uh, creating a level playing field by having everybody act distributed, even if they happen to be co-located. Boy, that's a great idea. I'll pay you that $10 here in a minute. Um, uh, and it, yeah, and it, that's a, it is literally, it's a great idea, and um, I'm going to talk about it quite a bit here in a second. Uh, you know, it's certainly not an original idea by, by me. I think a lot of teams come to that naturally, and I'm going to encourage you all to seriously consider adopting that model proactively. Uh, here in, in a minute. But here, I'll quickly go through some of the, the other distributed team structures that, that I have experience with, and some of you may have experience with, with others. Um, being that one remote person where everybody else, everybody else is co-located, has anybody been in this situation or you are in this situation now? A handful. Not too many. That's interesting. Um, I was in this situation for about five of, of those eight years uh, when I was Remote, and so my advice here if you find yourself in this situation is if you're the remote person, um, own it. Be the expert. Uh, the rest of your team is co-located at HQ or whatever and you we work at home from wherever. Um, it, you know, like really owning that experience, saying like, yes, I'm this weird outlier and I'm going to uh, do everything I possibly can to uh, to be the expert in the technology and in the collaboration aspects, because your team, it's, it's, it's going to be hard to, to sort of, I'm not, I'm not going to say it's going to be hard to motivate the team to do that, because I have found that it's actually the team is highly motivated to include me in, that case, in my experience, and that was awesome. I'm very humbled by that. But they're not going to have it, your situation on their radar as readily as you are, because you're living it. Um, but do find an office buddy. Find that person... Uh, on your team who is going to make sure the microphones are all hooked up and make sure that the computer, you know, that one wacky piece of audio software is installed and up to date. Uh, making sure that you get called into all the meetings and things like that. And I'm very humbled to say, I almost never had to ask for anybody to do this. They, somebody just said like, hey Joe, I'm going to be the person who uh, makes sure that you're all ready to go in all the meetings and stuff. I'm like, wow, thank you so much. Um, but I do say you have to be assertive but kind about being included uh, because, you know, people get distracted. People, you know, don't, uh, they're not going to be as readily on their mind uh, for logical reasons. You're not physically there to look over at and say like, oh my gosh, we forgot to call you about that thing. Um, and uh, be on time, be present, always be there for your team. Um, you know, don't fall into the trap of saying like, well, they're going to be five minutes late to the meeting, so I'm going to be 10 minutes late to the meeting or something like that. Um, and office folks, you know, it's kind of the revert, the opposite end of a lot of that stuff. You know, ho host those remote friendly meetings, you know, have that Zoom or whatever uh, attached to all the meeting and calendar invites. Uh, be an advocate of that distributed person. Be that office, office buddy. Uh, and as a team, have if you need them, dedicated and remote friendly workstations. So like here's a situation that we had where we had one remote person and the question to, well, where, where can I, t where do I go to talk to that person? It's always this workstation, every time. It's all set up, it's got the headphones, it's got the mics, it's got the uh, dedicated Zoom URL that you go to and it's all ready to go. Uh, we've had situations where we've had workstations like this with uh, really high quality external speakers uh, so you could have a an out loud group conversation without disturbing the people around you because the low fidelity internal speakers are annoying. Um, and you just have this one set up. And we've had situations where we had two or three workstations like this, and that person was always at that one station. Um, so that's, that's one tip. 
Um, I showed this picture a little bit earlier. There's these little iPad, floating head iPad things. Uh, they worked really well for me for quite a few years, actually. They're cobbled together out of random parts that they don't even really make anymore. Uh, and I've gotten feedback that having people walk around the office with these little things helped socialize me in the office. I wasn't that one person who worked from home that nobody ever saw. People saw me all the time as they carried me around like a little pizza you know, around the office. Um, but speaking from experience, watch out. You can, you can go down a rabbit hole for a long time, hours and hours, <laughs> years, and spend a lot of money trying to build some kind of remote presence device solution thing that, you know, that, that is not actually going to, that really doesn't, doesn't exist. Remember, it's not about building a better robot. It's about those, those people. So I eventually gave up on those things. But once in a while, I find myself on Amazon iPad dock microphone speaker cordless rechargeable. Zero results. Um, um, here's one that I, I've, I've run into a few times, a, t a team structure, which I call the split team, where you have like a product team, say, that is divided into and in two different locations. Uh, I was on a product team where half the team was in San Francisco and half in New York. And uh, this, this introduced a lot of the time zone issues. Uh, uh, that we mentioned a little bit earlier. And, and this is where I say, like, I think it's important to, def to decide how much one-on-one, uh, -on -one, per se, collaboration is really required. Um, and the team I was on, the, the mandate was, uh, this product and team has been isolated in San Francisco, and we want to reduce the risk of having that done, and we want to like be able to spread out the time zones and all that kind of stuff. So we want to have maximum amount of collaboration during the overlap time between the two time zones, so that we can extend the workday, so to speak, on this product, and also shift a lot of the context over from one geographic region to another one. So that required maximum collaboration, and so we. Uh, I won't go to it if we have bonus time at the end, um, but we basically would remote pair program across the overlapping time. Um, and they did that for about a year until I think they finally did decide to, to move the product to one location. Um, uh, but the other thing is to, uh, if, you, if you really need minimal, if you don't have that situation I just described, you know, see if there's a way of uh, carving out the domains that of your, the product that you're working on into a, a situation where you can kind of have them worked on more independently, but of course having a lot of collaboration. So for example, we had two teams on a different project. We're working on a banking application, and the banking application had uh, two major, major parts. One, bank account sign up, and the other part was bank account management, your transfers and that kind of stuff. And we identified that those two things were very, very separate and that we could have two teams that cl collaborated a lot and touched base a lot, but could kind of work on those two things separately um, and not step on each other's toes or have too many dependencies. So, you know, explore those two, those two things. Um, but what if you have a whole bunch of people that are distributed? You know, three, four, 20, who knows? Um, what do you do in that situation? And uh, we evolved, like your team over here, uh, like you, your team, we evolved uh, a process and repeated this process across multiple teams very successfully. Uh, and so I encourage you to proactively explore this, which is the idea that everyone's remote. And maybe this makes sense for the, you know, what if you have 20 people remote or half the team is remote and the other half is, uh, works from home or is in another location. Maybe this makes sense for a team of 20 where one person works from home. That's a tougher sell probably, but it might be worth it for you. But um, the idea is that when everyone is remote, then nobody is remote. It's just the way you work. You're just going to work. And of course, I'm not necessarily saying, all right, well, you know, step one, go back to your home offices, your offices and your cities, wherever you're at. Step two, turn in your badge. Uh, step three, buy a headset. And step four, go home. Um, that's not what I'm saying. You could do that. 
Uh, but really, the point is, is that it's a remote first approach and philosophy and ethos. It's that everybody acts distributed even if you're co-located for the situations where it makes sense. And it's a mindset. Uh, and you actually said this phrase, uh, it's a level playing field for everyone. It, stomp, it, it removes the tension of, well, we're in a room and they're all wherever, or we're in our team space and they're all wherever. It's like you're all just, you're just a distributed team working together in the ways that uh, enable distributed teams to work. And so how do you figure out well, like how do you figure out uh, how you're going to address each of those issues uh, or each sort of scenario? And the answer is you ask the question, if everyone was remote, how would we have our morning stand up? If everyone was remote, how would we uh, get together for happy hour? If everyone was remote, how would we do the thing? And sometimes the answer is not obvious. Uh, if everyone was remote, how would we pair programming? Whew, okay, remote pair programming, all right. Um, but luckily, like I was alluding to earlier, technology, there's a lot of technologies to enable uh, things now. So basically, it's a, it's a digital world, right? If, you need, if, uh, if, uh, if, we, if everyone was remote, how would we have a team norming session with sticky notes uh, so that everybody could arrange their sticky notes uh, in, along the scales that uh, along the scale that we want to put out there. Okay, well look, there's digital sticky note apps out there, um, and they're actually getting really good. Uh, there's Google Sheets, there's Trello, there's Miro, there's a lot of other digital whiteboards or web-based whiteboards and things like that. There's technologies out there that enable the philosophy. You know, again, that's the point. It's the people. If the people have the philosophy, there's going to be the enabling technologies that are going to help. And there's going to be a new one tomorrow because, hey, it's a distributed team startup oriented world out there. There's all these startups out there that have, um, are fully distributed teams themselves and are making products that enable, in a meta way, distributed teams to be as efficient, as efficient and collaborative as they possibly can. So I don't know if you've heard of any of these. There's Donut, which is like a Slack plugin that connects people so that they can get together and have a virtual donut and get to know each other. It's that virtual water cooler uh, thing, and it's like, hey, I've identified so-and-so. Would you like to talk to them on you know, uh, Friday at 2 p.m.? Um, there's this cool meeting owl thing you know, that's all about like, maximizing the fidelity that uh, your distributed team can talk to each other if you have uh, a meeting room with really bad audio, video, and such. Uh, there's virtual meeting spaces like you know this little you can't see it very well but like up in here uh, this is basically a virtual office and you can say oh well Tom and Jane are in the meeting room X right now uh, looks like they're probably having a one-on-one -on -one, so I won't ask them to join my meeting it's all kinds of stuff anybody use anything like any of these tools ah cool handful of people great um, here's uh, so we had asked the question uh, if everyone was remote, how would we figure out our pairing, our pair programming um, schedule for each day? And also figure out what streams of work we're all working on. So we fired up a Trello over here with everybody's faces. And this is a split screen over on the, on the right is the, the video. Uh, and we're rearranging these cards. It's like, oh, okay, well, like, um, uh, you know, Kelly and Zoe were pairing yesterday, so we should probably split them up because they just finished the story they were working on, blah, blah, blah. And we're dragging these things around. And we're all you know, collaborating on Zoom here. But I want to point out something here. I can do this, I think, if you can see my mouse. I don't know if you notice in about half of these videos, there's a staircase in the background. Half of these people are sitting side by side by side by side. And the other people are like in Pennsylvania, in Connecticut, in Virginia, and not just in those states, but in multiple locations in those states. Uh, so the people who could have gone to a meeting room and shouted at the microphone instead stayed uh, at their desk with their super high quality headsets and you know, their Macs with a good video and all that kind of stuff. And we just did it here because, because don't bother booking a conference room. Who, who needs a conference room? I'm in a conference room instantly, anytime I want to be. 
uh, added to the, you know, and they, we have these sessions on our stand up every morning, uh, which was on the team calendar. If it's not on the calendar, it doesn't exist. Uh, and this is part of the growing pains I've found that teams will kind of go through when they have a group of co-located folks and some distributed folks uh, or some remote folks where certain meetings start uh, when everybody gets back from lunch. Well, you're in three time zones and when everybody in San Francisco gets back from lunch, they can look at each other and go, one, two, three, four, five, we're back from lunch. But what does that mean for the rest of the team? Um, so if it's not on the calendar, it's not real. Um, doing things like having dedicated links, uh, Zoom and a bunch of other apps support this. Just have a dedicated bookmarkable, nameable link that you just jump into uh, where there's no question. Uh, what Zoom link, what's that Zoom link? It's the same one we've been using for the last six months and you've bookmarked it and we've given it a, a kitschy name as well. Um, jumping into people's different, and uh, extending that to have maybe your team, everybody has a dedicated uh, video chat room. You can just jump in to start collaborating with folks. Uh, we had a great situations where, you know, on our software, uh, or I should say our, our you know, development team, you know, we had our product manager and our designer would just sort of, once a day, just sort of cycle through the links of uh, the, the pair, because we did all remote pair programming. There, we had dedicated remote pair programming video rooms, and they would just kind of cycle through once or twice a day, popping into rooms like, hey, need anything? And the answer was always yes. Like, oh, yeah. We got to figure out this one thing. Uh, so that was great. You know, it's like the, that was the virtual tap on the shoulder of the, maybe your product manager walking around your team space or something like that. Um, and doing things like avoiding DMs and just saying things in your team channel so that everybody can kind of see the chatter that's going on. And yes, that can get overwhelming and that can be too much and you might have to norm around like how much of that you do. Uh, but uh, you'll very often be like, hey, what's that, what's that one document that I, I, we need for our team to do whatever? Oh, here it is. And you DM it. Well, the rest of the team needs that too. So say it in the team space. Uh, but hey, get together. Somebody was saying this uh, earlier, face to face time. You know, it's not about everybody just running for the hills and, and getting the best internet you possibly can. Uh, you still want to get together, play ping pong, go out to lunch. Um, have that real face-to-face -face time uh, because it is really valuable, super valuable. So that was majority around everyone's remote, which you know is a logical place that a lot of teams will get to, but but it may be a painful process to get there. Uh, and I'm uh, you know, asking you to seriously consider being proactive about adopting that strategy if it seems like it makes sense for your team. Um, thoughts, feedback, war stories? Yes. So we do a decent amount of the like everyone remote strategy using like Skype for business. But one issue that we've run into for people who do work in the office is that there's like two or three of those going on in a certain area. It can be really hard when trying to understand what I'm mm. doing. Um, so you're talking about sort of the amount of distraction you can have. If, you, if everyone is acting remote, then there's a lot of uh, you know, Skype sessions going on at the same time. Um, I would definitely encourage uh, you, if you're, if you're not already, maybe you are, to like have the team get really great headsets and not have that, those conversations through the absolutely horrible speakers that are built into all computers and laptops and such. So, you know, and I'm, I'm glad you're bringing that up because uh, one of my pitfalls uh, we'll get to here in a sec, uh, but I'll tell you now is that low sound quality, for example, affects everyone. If you can't see and if you can't hear or be heard, it's super frustrated, fr frustrating. And if you have 10 really bad um, Skype conversation, uh, audio conversations going on at the same time with low quality speakers and stuff. It just, it has that annoying, that annoying sound that's hard to identify. I'm not a sound engineer, so I don't know why it's pretty much universally hated. Um, uh, but yeah, get a, get a good headset. Uh, and sometimes, you know, taking, pick, you know, if you have a laptop or something like that, picking that up and going to a phone booth kind of a thing, that might be one of those situations where if you have a lot of, uh, a, a lot of distributed teams in your office, you may have, that, have to have the conversations with your facilities folks about having uh, a lot of sort of phone booth-like areas where you can have these conversations because you're on a call a lot. Anything else? Yes. Uh, what tools do you use now for peer programming? 
Um, remote pair programming tools, we use, a, a lot of people use Zoom right now. Um, in my opinion, the best one is the, the screen sharing that's built into Max, but you have to have like a VPN connection for that. Um, a lot of people use like Tmux and Vim and things like that. So there's, there's a whole suite of tools that I can, I can, I can share out. Uh, but uh, my number one tip would be try all of them and use the ones that work best for you but ha and have backups as well. So we use, uh, we're gonna, like, we use slots, uh, like remote um, Right, uh, yeah, Screen Hero. Uh, there was something called Screen Hero. Rest in peace, boy. That was brutal. Um, that was, the, what was one of the best tools uh, and then Slack bought it uh, and then kind of kind of killed it, which is really too bad. Yeah, remote typing, it's the, the screen sharing texts I just described that allow two-way uh, typing, allow you to share your uh, actual ability to edit the screen. Uh, and uh, some people have been talking a bit about uh, VS Code has a uh, share, a collaborative mode or a plugin that acts kind of like, it's like Google Docs for code. Um, so definitely check that out. Uh, yes, one more. Mm. Yes, um, uh, like uh, sound dampening or canceling headphones, making it sound like you have a cold <laughs> or that you're uh, yelling loud. Yeah, that's called, um, oh gosh, what's that called? When you hear your own feedback through your, your headset, I think it's called side channel. Um, so if you Google for side channel, there's a few plugins and apps out there uh, and really good headsets or really good USB adapters for your headsets. The, 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 it, there was one by Turtle Beach. I don't think they make it anymore. It would feed your sound back into your own headset. Um, a lot of the apps out there and, and headsets don't do that by default. But look up side channel audio and there'll be some tools out there. All right. All right. One more. What if you can't get any budget? Oh my god, you guys are the greatest. Seriously. Um, um, what's the most important pro tip? Solve your problems with money. <laughs> uh, you know, the using terrible tools and bad equipment uh, is, is incredibly frustrating and incredibly wasteful. Um, dear budget managers, um, perhaps speaking to someone you know, sir. Uh, the cost of your employees' wasted time is almost certainly more expensive than whatever that equipment is that they requested. Um, this is hard because when somebody says, like, I need a $300 headset, um, and they're like, wow, that's just, that's just way too much. Uh, can't you just use uh, some Apple earbuds or something like that or something from you know, the impulse purchase th section of the gas station. Um, and, you know, and, and I'm, not, I'm not an expert in having this conversation because the fact is, is I work for a company that is like, you want that headset? Fill out a ticket, it'll be there tomorrow, basically. Um, you know, but having a conversation around like, okay, well, we've had to reschedule this one meeting five, with 20 people three times uh, because the company refuses to buy business grade internet for that important person who lives in wherever, uh, in a rural area or something like that. What is the cost of the rescheduling of those 20 people, those 60 um, you know, person hours, plus all of the overhead of getting, you know, scheduling and all that? And I, know, and I don't know how to, to, to sell that other than having conversations like that, but like the, the, co the waste in dealing with bad equipment, bad um, uh, tools and things like that is so expensive. And I'm not saying it's a trivial problem. Maybe they have to buy 500 people $300 headsets and that's a lot of money. But you, but the, you need to account for the costs and the wastes of not having those as well. So good luck with that conversation. And if you have any tips, I definitely am all ears and I would love to pass it on. Um, 
Well, since we're doing pro tips and stuff, this was the number one thing. If you can buy it, expense it, get it for free, uh, but use high quality stuff when you can. Um, pitfalls. So yeah, this is, this is uh, pro tips, pit pitfalls, and, and, and uh, patterns and such. So technology is the worst. You know, your VPN is going to crash. Um, you know, your VPN is going to crash. They're going to stop making that awesome audio adapter that you wanted. Uh, uh, an awesome company like Slack is going to kill an awesome product like Screen Hero. Um, you know, that kind of stuff is going to happen. Complain, get it out of your system, and then move on to the next best thing. And always have a backup. Um, we all, if you're in this room, you work with technology, and it's just a part of life. And if you have, and then this gets into the it's worth it part. You know, the other thing you could do is just not have distributed teams, and you don't have to worry about this. But if that's not an option, then embrace it. And if you have to use an old version of WebEx for something, uh, then complain about it, and then become the best WebEx person you possibly can be. Uh, because it's just a lot of wasted uh, time and energy and, and emotional uh, energy to just worry about it all the time. It's your life. Remember this thing? Uh, Ethernet is crazy fast and super stable. and doesn't futz out whenever like, somebody turns on a microwave. Um, and uh, you know, something that, that's worth calling out is like, if you work from home, say, you might think your Ethernet is great but you're not on the other, set, other end of that conversation necessarily, of that uh, remote pairing session or that video session. Everybody's watching your blurry, grainy you know, face or whatever. Um, if, you get, you know, if you can do it, plug your computer directly into the ethernet. It's a great way of saying like, well, maybe you don't need that business grade internet. Maybe you just had terrible Wi-Fi. Right. Um, see and be seen, turn your video on. Um, and I understand there's many situations where you wouldn't I did the, uh, want to do that. Like I uh, gave this exact session um, uh, recently, and we actually had a bunch of people join remotely. And those folks uh, did not turn their video on, and that is okay, because the other option is that, like, you know, sir, can you just come and stand right here behind me silently with your face <laughs> for for an hour? <laughs> you can't say anything, and don't look at your phone or anything. Just stand. yeah, exactly. Um, <laughs> this might be an awkward situation for a lot of people. Oh, clearly not for you, which is awesome. Um, <laughs> Uh, thanks. There. <laughs> uh, you know, so I get it. You know, you don't always want to have your video on. But if you're doing, having a meeting with folks and, you know, you know turn that video on, be, be present, you know, have, you know, be able to uh, have people so they can see your eyes, see your face, see your expression. And that gets into introverted, extroverted stuff. That's, this can be tough for people. Some people have no problem coming and talking in front of a crowd of people like this. But the second a camera is on them, then it's like game over. Uh, and and that's, that could be a delicate situation. And, and that could be one of those things to talk about in that team norming, where somebody says, like, hey, I just have a super hard time with cameras. And, you know, I don't want to get into it, but it's a problem. But, hey, I promise that I'm present. I promise that I'm engaged. And, you know, maybe that person is going to make extra efforts in other ways, audio cues, talking more, um, signaling in some other way, if they can't do that. Back to the audio thing, the, the, the sound quality inside of laptops and stuff is the worst. Um, and doing like that little uh, video thing I was showing earlier of people carrying remote presence devices around an office, that, did not, that w was not a laptop because those, that audio and microphone is just the worst. You know, buy uh, the accessories that you need uh, to make that, to, to, to bump up the quality level there. You know, buy this stuff if you can. Um, this is hilarious if you haven't seen this. Uh, it's a conference call bingo. Uh, even the most efficient teams do all of these. Uh, and sometimes, you know, it's kind of funny. It's like, you, you, sometimes you have to. Can you see my screen? Um, if you're screen sharing, you want to make sure people can see your screen. Um, if somebody's on mute, you have to tell them that they're not, you know, to, to mute themselves. Uh, but uh, you know, you, you, the dynamic is a little bit different in these like big collaborative uh, meetings. I've got a slide that, that I, I didn't show it, that has you know like 300 people on a town hall uh, in in a Zoom. You know, you have to be able to see <laughs> that person's screen uh, if they're running a town hall or something like that. Um, here's some fun pro tips. This evolved on a recent project, uh, and I'm really thankful that it 
we did. So we're like, well, like we, we know, identified several things. People were talking over each other. Some people were really quiet. Some people didn't know when to jump in because the dynamics of like a video call is, is different than maybe a, a meeting room. Uh, so one of the things we did is like we had everybody start off muted and one person would uh, raise their hand to speak, schoolhouse kind of style, and then that person would speak. And when somebody else wanted to speak, uh, then somebody else would raise their hand and an inter inter interesting thing would happen and that the rest of the group would watch for people raising their hands. And when there was a little break, a third person would sort of unmute themselves and say, you know, hey, Rohit, did you want to say something? And he was like, oh, yes, I did. Thank you. Um, and it w became very efficient and, and very sort of democratized. Uh, and it was also, after a while, you kind of saw the pattern of people who never spoke. And people could become advocates of those people and say, you know, maybe chat with them off to the side and be like, hey, you know, is there anything you wanted to contribute during that? It's something we could do to enable that. Um, here's some Zoom pro tip stuff around making recurring meetings that never die. Sorry, I know you can't see it very well, but if you dig into Zoom's preferences, you can make meetings that uh, never end and you can revisit them forever uh, if you have a pro account. And then up on the top, making those bookmark, those uh, kitschy bookmarkable links with bit.ly or another URL, URL shortener or something like that. So that the team can just go into the team room or uh, work stream three at any time. And it, it, it reduces the friction of jumping uh, into conversations between different people. Uh, can I do a quick time check? About 10 minutes or so, 15, I think. Um, cool, I think we're doing okay. Um, yeah, add a, add, a, add a Zoom link to everything. Um, and then this, I call this walkie talkie mode in Zoom, if you use Zoom, where you can say, press and hold the space bar to temporarily unmute yourself. So the great thing about that is you start every meeting with everybody muted, and then you just hold down the space bar to talk. Some of the stuff is super practical, not nearly as deep as <laughs> some of the previous conversations. But I find that like, when you kind of combine some of these little tips, you, you, you make your way towards an even more efficient way of working together. Um, the, the screen sharing, in my opinion, is built into Macs that nobody uses, uh, is the best and highest fidelity and, the, and just like being on that computer. But you do have to have a direct connection to that computer. So if you're doing remote pair programming, uh, especially, this might be something you want to check out. If you're just sharing your screen in a meeting or something like that, then clearly Zoom or something like that works well. But Zoom is getting, for two-way typing uh, on a computer doing remote pair programming, Zoom is actually, you know, I feel like I'm being uh, unloyal to my friend here, uh, built-in screen sharing, but Zoom is actually getting pretty good. Um, so sometimes it may not be worth the overhead. A little bit of stuff about working from home. Um, and this, they like, let's get back to some more very opinionated stuff. Uh, and, and I found myself having to sort of, when I was working from home for a long time, I had to sort of fight the stereotype or fight the, um, the bias of like, well, a lot of times when people work from home, they're not really working. Um, and maybe this resonates with some of you in, in your organization, but like the W, <laughs> w uh, you know, working from home is working. Who cares where you're at? You know, if, I, if I'm kind of pushing like, hey, everybody's remote, doesn't matter where you're at, your, uh, your pr presence has nothing to do with your physical location, then, you know, be respectful, show up presentable, in my opinion. Uh, I definitely, you know, even, you know, it could be one of those situations where like, even if you are, if one is in bed with a cat on their head and like, you know, the cover's pulled up to here and like their head's on the pillow, they might be super engaged and absolutely um, you know, uh, contributing as much or more than somebody else. But is that sending the message that, like, I'm here to crush it today? <laughs> uh, and also, like, there, you know, there's also an interesting dynamic in many organizations, and, and mine is one of them, where you know, working from home is kind of like a, maybe a special case. And, if, if, and if, you, if a signal is being sent that like, maybe that is being taken advantage of or that uh, you know, people might be jealous of that situation. So like, you know, I drove an hour and a half through terrible traffic to be here in the office and you're at the dog park, you know, 
or Whole Foods or whatever, or they're all take, taking this call. It's like, I, I just, I, I understand like every situation is different. You know, maybe you're in your car because you have to pick up your kid. That's pretty important. Children need their parents to come and pick them up. Uh, but I just think it's worth calling out and saying, being aware, you know, of the, the fact that uh, you know, you're, you, not everybody might have this special privilege of working from home if that's the dynamic in your organization. Um, the flip side is maybe people working, uh, you know, being on video and things like that is this like novel thing. And you think it'd be really hilarious to like clown around behind the camera with that person who is telling somebody that they're not getting a raise this year. The point is, you don't necessarily know what that conversation, uh, what's happening in that conversation. And I've been in this situation, both sides, again, I'm culpable on both sides of, you know, seeing somebody I know, you know, somebody's on a video call and I know that person and I'm like, hey, how's it going? And like later that person pulled the, uh, you know, the person in the office pulled me aside and was like, man, you, that, was, that was really awkward. That was really awkward. Um, little points of awareness. Uh, here's a good one in our increasingly distributed world, intercommunicated, you know, uh, world of intercommunication, especially like uh, I find that I have this situation in, um, in uh, as a consultant a lot, working with a lot of different organizations. It's a different group every time. Uh, is getting to know your, the information security folks or the security folks uh, digital security folks in your org because like you might be asking for some stuff from them to make all this work that they're not gonna like you're like hey uh, IT I need to open a couple of ports for me to the internet oh yeah why is that I need to be able to seamlessly transport large volumes of information out of your network <laughs> to this guy who works uh, in a cabin in Michigan um, all the time uh, as seamlessly as, as possible, so could you do that for me? No! <laughs> you just described how that guy's gonna get fired. Is his person to prevent something like, 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 it's like, oh sure, and I'll just go ahead and call CNN right now and tell them, you know, the, about this terrible data breach, and also, you know, get ourselves sued. Uh, so, understand that you need to work closely with them. It's their job to protect the, uh, the, the network security and other digital security inside of their organization. Your, the thing you're asking for might help your team a lot, but look like a huge risk to them. Work collaboratively with them. Uh, you know, get to a place where you realize you're both on the same team. They're not trying to block you because they're jerks. You're not trying to get the company to go bankrupt. You know, you're both on the same team. Uh, and also, hey, maybe they're wild turkey folks. Any thoughts on any of that kind of stuff? I think we're probably, as I predicted, getting low on time. Um, and any other kind of pro tips and tips and such before we look at some technologies? Now, spoiler alert, the technologies are just all the technologies you already use. There's nothing really new here. Um, and uh, uh, so you know, I can talk a little bit about like remote pairing tools specifically or something like that, although we, we talked about that already. But any other pro tips or things to avoid that you've identified on your teams that you'd like to share with the group. And then I can reshare it in a session like this later. Anything? Anything, anybody disagree with anything I set up here? That'd be great, like that work from home thing? That was pretty opinionated. Go ahead. I have a question, do you, do you have like your the team working arrangement? I mean, at Pivotal, do you guys have like that as a document, like some thing that like everyone can see and agree on? Yeah, sure. Um, so it was around sort of the team norming uh, sessions and do we do something like, uh, like post that as maybe a poster in our team room or something like that or, or radiate that out some, some way. Uh, we often will do that. We'll often put, do those, uh, you know, how do you like to communicate? How do you, you know, how do you like to, uh, are you introverted or extroverted? Um, how do you like feedback? those kind of scales with the little X's that people have put on there. We'll often do that on what, one of those sheets, the giant sticky note sheets, like the whatever they are, three by two by three or something like that, and put them up in our, in our team area so we can reference those. Um, uh, so I think that that's a tip that I could, could add to this as, as a reminder. Sure. Yeah, I had an issue where I have a team 
part of the team is in Brazil, part of the team is here in the U.S., and there's dev teams there in Brazil and also in the U.S., and uh, I run a platform engineering team, mm -hmm. so we had people, the developers would go to their favorite co-located people. Mm -hmm. So what we wound up having to do is run a patrol, have mm -hmm. a patrol person in Slack on our, on our team channel, and um, let that be the incoming for all unplanned work. So um, if anything was outside of our sprint, Right. That's that's a great tip. You know, having a point person for <clears throat> communication so that it doesn't turn into, you know, geographic centered, you know, uh, communication. So um, it, so it's great that your team identified that somehow you identified that this was a problem was and context, you did something about it. Yeah, context sharing. Yeah, that's great. I'm glad you guys did that. That's a good tip. Anything else? Sure. Right, actually, in India, we then start, um, and they wouldn't know what actually was going on, right. what happened. So we actually had a rule there that they had to share. Everyone in Europe had to share where they they finished off, so that everyone else could start. And otherwise, you always had that context that you missed. Right, and that's a tough one. The context switching between, especially if there's very little overlap in the, and if you're trying to make it such that when um, Europe goes to sleep, India picks up the same work, exactly the same work. Uh, not related work, but the same work with, this, with the context. That is super hard. Um, so I'm glad that you all, and this is a similar thing that happens where you know, there's ideally, I think at least in Europe, you, you can sometimes have some overlap. You know, maybe it's, I think in the US, it's often like 12 hours difference. So in Europe, maybe you get an hour or something like that to have some overlap time. Um, but yeah, like, and that's one of those things where, you, you know, you, you, as, a, as a team, as an organization, you need to identify, does that model work? Maybe it works well for your team, and that's, that's great, of passing the context on so you maybe have a 24-hour continuous development cycle or something like that. Or, uh, uh, but you know, there's going to be teams out there that say, like, that's not working for them, and they have to find something else. So every team is unique, I'm sure. All right, almost, almost out of time. A couple more minutes. Anything else? Yes. Sure. Um, so I played around with a lot of the virtual whiteboards, but mm -hmm. they all suffer the same problem of the tool to actually draw it. Yes. And mice are terrible. Yep. We even have a smart whiteboard that's got this to drag. It's very difficult to draw. Right. Is there something that you've used to help with that? So um, where did I have something? This, this thing. So I, I agree that losing an actual whiteboard, the ability to really draw boxes and arrows especially, um, is really a huge loss when you have a distributed team. Um, the only thing I've really, I've experienced is this one here is called, you, sorry, you can't read it, it's, it's, if you Google for like a web whiteboard, um, then it's one of the many web whiteboards that suffer the same drawing problems you described with actually being able to pick up a pencil-like thing. But the, what we were able to do uh, and we weren't able to scale it to the whole team, which was kind of a bummer, is we, had, uh, we would pull this up on an iPad uh, with a stylus. Uh, and I think, if you're staying at the Marriott, the pen that they, give, that they have in the room for the little pad of paper has a stylus on the other end of it. And it worked remarkably well. Uh, and uh, you could share this too, so you could have two people drawing on it at the same time. And I have heard some people talking about uh, the newer iPads, I think the iPad Pro, I think has a collaborative whiteboard thing that you could share with other people, either on computers or on a white, uh, iPad Pro. And I've heard people say really good things about that. I have not used them myself. Does anybody, we have one minute or less, uh, does anybody have a virtual whiteboard suggestion? It's not cheap, but you could try Microsoft's uh, Surface. Uh, yeah, the Surface thing. Right. Have you used the Microsoft Surface thing? Right. So just uh, follow my tip. Ask your budget manager to buy you 300 Surfaces, uh, and problem solved. Right. Right. All right. I think that's it. Thank you, everyone. Uh, okay. And I'll be around. Uh, feel free to, if you see me walking around, track me down. Uh, uh, let me know. I welcome your feedback as well. 
um, and any uh, additional tips and tricks and such that I can add to a deck like this?